Um, in order to kick off this meeting, I will go through a very short number of slides to make sure everyone from our attendees or people following us online are able to engage with us in the uh, exciting event ahead of us. For that purpose, I will share my screen one more time to go through a few uh, basics around using Zoom or engaging with our speakers. Um, and um, let me start that off. Um, Sorry, I'm struggling a little bit with the full screen and small screen, but at the moment, I guess you can see um, uh, um, the slide of the title of this event. Um, thank you for joining this live debate. Uh, we will dedicate the ICSW event this time on reimagining the global governance on the eve of the UN's 75th anniversary. We have a multitude of speakers with uh, very different backgrounds, very different uh, institutional and uh, uh, personal experiences to share. And we will do that in a format that will hopefully engage all of us who are present at this event. In order to do so, uh, first of all, please make sure that you check the interpretation on the Zoom icons below on your screen. There is one icon called interpretation and make sure that you listen in the language of your preference. We have English, Spanish and French available. Excuse us for all the other languages that we could not um, uh, engage with in, in this event, but we hope that these three will be enough in order to follow the content of the whole event. In order to make sure that you can listen very carefully to the interpretation, please also mute original audio. Sometimes it helps and makes it much more clear to really follow the conversation of what the speaker is saying. If you already have noticed as an attendee, you are um, muted and your video is off. Only the speakers and the moderator are the ones that have their video on. However, the engagement at this event will not be limited to the mics and the videos, but we will be happy to engage with you through the Q&A box as well as the chat box. On top of that, at this event, we will have five polls or statements that we will ask for your opinion. And in that way, we uh, will hear your opinion or agree, disagree, or different types of opinions on um, agreed, uh, pre-prepared statements that you could already see when you registered for the event. Uh, also, in addition to that, we have two illustrators uh, connecting to us from Serbia who are actually graphically recording the whole event. So everything that has been said will be kind of set in stone, but not really in stone, but in a pencil and paper and creatively drawn. So we will be happy to share with all of you the graphic recording after the event is over. Another important point I wanted to mention was that um, when you look at the screen and um, you want to see only the speaker, or you wanna see a multitude of faces that have their videos on, please adjust your view as you wish on the top uh, right corner of your screen. Um, you can easily adapt it and play with it so you find the right um, kind of um, speaker view that, that you would like to have on your screen. As a last uh, point, how to make the best out of this event. Definitely listen carefully. We will have 10 speakers giving their opinions on the different statements in a very short, rapid way. We would definitely encourage you to type with us, engage by typing questions in the Q&A box or the chat box. We will not maybe be able to answer all the questions verbally, but we will make sure that as much as we can, we type back or speakers type back with you so you can get answers or reactions to your comments right away. As well, please be aware that this is part of the ICSW journey 2021. Uh, feedback on every virtual event is very important to us. So at the end of this event, you will get a question that you can answer so we can figure out whether this event was any value for your time. And at the same time, we would ask you to sign up for our newsletter in order to be able to join our ICSW journey that is definitely not um, uh, a neither beginning, neither ending soon. We are now at the sixth virtual event and a lot of virtual, but also offline activities are up and coming in the pipeline. You can also visit our website to learn more about the people power topic and the whole engagement that we are offering from uh, April uh, this year. 
Um, as a last point, I want to just walk you through the event flow of today. Uh, basically, um, we will have five statements that all of you will be able to engage with. And the interesting part is that we will give a minute or two uh, for you to be able to answer the polls. Then um, you will be given uh, expert input by two experts per statement. So two experts will give their opinion and their say on the topic and the statement that was given, but also a little bit reflecting and reacting to what the poll has showed us. What are the opinions of the attendees at this event? As a step three, you will be able, after listening to the experts, to also engage and maybe share a little bit of feedback or comments in the chat box or Q&A box in order to hear from you whether something of what was said has changed your mind, your opinion, or enriched your knowledge or information around the topic that is discussed. This event flow will be repeated five times, so really get ready for a quite a dynamic event. And in order to make all of this possible, I will not go through the five statements at the moment, but I will give the floor to uh, the moderator of this event, Oli Henman. Be, uh, because of Oli, we have all this diversity of speakers and we have the most amazing content prepared. I hope that uh, the excitement will be shared by all the attendees as well. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and allow Oli to continue with the moderation and introducing speakers and statements. Thank you so much, Bistra. And it's uh, wonderful to work with you and with Civicus uh, as uh, so many times uh, over the years. Um, and it's wonderful to see so many uh, familiar faces on this call today. Um, this theme um, of the 75th anniversary of the UN uh, is a crucial theme for so many of us. Um, and we didn't expect necessarily, um, you know, six months ago or a year ago, that it would be happening at the same time as such major global um, disruptions that have been caused by the COVID pandemic. Um, so I think this uh, debate is incredibly timely and actually has become more urgent than ever because of the reality that the world is facing and the need to uh, build back better or build a different model uh, when we eventually emerge from the current uh, pandemic. So this uh, debate, um, as you say, um, takes a, a much more interactive approach and we're looking forward to having lots of interest and feedback um, from many of you who are joining us and we have a very rich and experienced panel to then go through the different questions. Um, so I guess we, we can move into the first of those questions to, to warm you up and get you started. Uh, and the first question is quite a broad one. Um, it's really asking you, do you think that the UN is living up to its promise of we the peoples? So the founding statement, as we know, of the UN uh, starts with we the peoples and it highlights many of the key um, values that many of us stand for in terms of progressive international cooperation uh, and uh, the, the core principles of human rights, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So do you feel that those original notions of, of the peoples coming together are being followed through? Um, so you have three options. I think many people have already done it. So it's either you agree, you disagree, or if you're not sure, you can say it's complicated. So we'll just give it another 30 seconds or so. Please get your vote in. 10 seconds or so. We're just giving it one minute. So it's been, well, interesting. I won't say anything yet. I'll leave it to the panelists to comment. Okay, I think that's it now. We'll close the time. There we go. So quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, result there. Um, less uh, positive than you might have thought. So uh, let's, let's hear now from our first two panelists who are uh, very experienced in this area. Particularly, I'd like to start now with Natalie Samara Singh, who is the Chief, Strategy, Chief of Strategy to the Special Advisor on the UN 75th anniversary. So has been closely involved in uh, the discussions within the UN. Uh, was the chief speech writer for the president of the 73rd session of the General Assembly and before that for many years the director at UNA UK. Uh, Natalie, how do you see this poll? What is your reaction to what you've seen there? Thanks, Oli. I mean, I don't want to sound like a, a, you know, an evasive UN official, but I had to go with it's complicated too. 
And I think what I just wanted to say today was let's look at what that opening promise of the UN Charter actually says. I think first you have we the people's resolve to achieve peace development and human rights. So I think the first thing you need to do to look at that question is say, has the UN done that? And the record is obviously mixed. On the one hand, the UN has played a key role in the huge strides forward we have made over the past 75 years in life expectancy, in living standards. Today and every day, it feeds, shelters and protects millions of people and serves as a crucial lifeline. You always have to ask who would step into the breach if it wasn't there. It has helped bring about international laws and norms that have improved all of our lives. Wherever you are, whoever you are, you will have benefited from treaties to protect human rights, tackle deadly weapons, and lift standards in health and the environment. And the UN has supported people's movements for freedom. Look at decolonization, the fight against apartheid, and the struggles that remain for so many of us today. But we all know the UN's failures are well documented and tragic. How many times have we said never again? How many kinds have we kept quiet, acted too slowly or timidly, or abused the trust placed in us? And that brings me to, to my second point. How is it that we, the people, say they're going to take forward that promise in the Charter? The Charter is very clear. It is by working through their government. The UN was conceived as an organization of states. Civil society did play a role in San Francisco, but this premise was never questioned. So the U UN is the United Nations. It is what it says on the tin. Both its critics and its supporters like to think it's more, uh, but it isn't. But that doesn't mean it should, it should stay that way. I think one of the biggest changes that has taken place since 1945 is the multitude of actors that now work with the UN. Governments are no longer the only or even the key players in many sectors. Small NGOs are often much more effective on the ground. Big businesses are larger than many economies. So the UN has to adapt and we the peoples has to become more than a phrase. That has been the direction of travel, but it's been much too slow and so, so much more needs to be done. That message emerged loud and clear from the global consultation we undertook this year for the 75th anniversary. People want to have their say. That has been a core part of the Secretary General's vision for a more inclusive UN. And even governments in the UN 75 political declaration have recognized that the challenges we face today require whole of society responses. So personally, I believe we need more partnerships, more than the usual tokenistic events. We need meaningful ongoing involvement of me, the, uh, we the peoples in decision-making and delivery so that the UN global cooperation uh, is not just something states do, but a global partnership that leaves no one behind Thank you, Natalie. I think we lost just the last couple of words there, but uh, but we certainly got the spirit of everything you were saying. And thank you for keeping to time. I should have reminded everyone, apologies, that we only have three minutes each. So thank you so much, Natalie, for being uh, bang within that time. Um, and we'll just be keeping an eye, as you saw, Bistra has the, the flags there to remind people. So uh, thank you for starting us off. Uh, now, next, uh, I'd like to come to Daniela, uh, Daniela Vancic, uh, the European Program Manager with Democracy International, um, and has previously worked as a human in the Human Rights Department at the Serbian Mission at the UN in uh, Geneva. So, uh, Daniela, how do you see this poll and, and the wider trends in terms of how the UN is delivering on its original mission? Yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, before I go into answer um, how I answered the poll, I'll give a little bit of background and context about uh, a campaign that we, Democracy International, is actually working with Civicus and with uh, Democracy Without Borders to bring we the peoples to life. Um, and that's a campaign for uh, a new participatory tool at the UN. It's called the UN World Citizens Initiative. Um, the basic idea is that a number of world citizens that would be geographically representative 
um, they would be able to collect signatures on a certain topic within the EU's competence, uh, within the UN, UN's competence, sorry. And once a, a certain threshold of uh, those signatures are met, uh, then the UN General Assembly would have to respond uh, to that topic as, as they see fit and then take action. Um, and if you're EU based, you probably think this sounds a little bit familiar because the European Citizens Initiative is exactly what um, our idea for a UN World Citizens Initiative is based on. Um, and by the way, our, our campaign uh, for such a tool at the global level is also called We the Peoples for a World Citizens Initiative. So we're really trying to bring this to life. Um, but to go back to the, to the question um, on if, in my opinion, the, the UN is really living up to its promise of We the Peoples, um, I would say I disagree um, with this, that they're living up to this promise. There has been, of course, in recent years, a greater attempt to bring in civil society voices and give NGOs a direct platform at the UN. But as for everyday individuals, um, for the everyday peoples, let's call it, there has not really been this opportunity yet. Um, unless, of course, you are um, a high profile activist, if you are a Greta Thunberg of, of the world, for example, there's not really been that real chance for a normal citizen to uh, share their voices at the UN and uh, to be able to use the or UN as a tool to organize on a certain topic. Um, it's of course a, a huge challenge even to do so. We have to, we have to recognize that um, to be able to do that in an organized manner, thinking how um, 7 billion people in this world. But uh, it's this exact deficit why we are proposing a UN World Citizens Initiative um, to be able to close that gap, to establish that tool that regular citizens can use um, to express their concerns on the global stage. Um, so I see I have one minute left. I, I really look forward to answering your questions and um, I can also add the link to that campaign uh, if you in the chat if you're interested in reading more about our campaign. We have over 200 NGO supporters so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, really powerful to see a very practical tool there. And yes, I, I remember the campaign for the European Citizens Initiative. It'd be interesting to see how you would actually organize the, uh, you know, the petition system globally. But I think it's a very exciting uh, model. It'd be good to see if there are questions or comments on what you've heard so far. Let me see in the chat box here. Well, maybe I could I could ask an initial question um, back to to Natalie, if if I may, just to start things off. Um, Natalie, you mentioned some of the ways that you see the UN has delivered. So, for example, supporting people's movements and so on. Do you think there's an appetite within the UN system to give more direct channels for those voices to come through? How would you see that working in practical terms within the constraints that you've highlighted about a sort of a state based system? I think I think many of us recognize that we have to do it because you look at our, you know, the tasks we're given, our mandates are huge, the resources are shrinking. Um, how are we ever going to deal with all these issues without the local knowledge, the, the, the expertise of, of others? So I think it's just a, record, a common sense recognition that we have. The challenge is how do you do it? I think I, I'm excited by the fact that in the 75th anniversary year, we've seen our officers on the ground and others just really relish being given a mandate to engage and to ask. But I have to be honest, I, the flip side of it is that it's hard to change a system that pushes back. There are always those who say, if I work with this group, how will it be seen by the government, etc. So that's why the change can't come from inside. It has to come from a mixture of you know, public pressure, of willingness to change leadership from the UN, but also ultimately uh, you know, states. And I hope that but this pandemic and some of the other challenges has really made governments realize they're not going to be able to solve this. This is something that shows that we need all of the society to respond. So I'm hopeful, um, but you know, change is slow at the UN and it does need that, you know, that kind of push and support. And I think we do have an opportunity. We heard from you know, all UN member states from you know, a million of pe people took our survey, millions more took part in this, this initiative today. And that groundswell of support has to be channeled into something. So I do think it's a good time right now with all the uncertainty, as well as this initiative, to really push for something new. Thanks, thanks, Natalie. And, and Daniela, maybe to you, um, the, the question that I sort of hinted at when, when you told us about the, the Citizens Initiative, do you have any more thoughts on how that would actually work? And have you had interest from particular member states perhaps to support it? What's your feeling in terms of next steps and what can we do to help you with that? 
Yeah, exactly. Thanks for that. Um, of course, this is a campaign that's really um, a bottom up campaign. We really want NGOs to be behind it. NGOs as the organizing citizens really organize civil society. Um, so as I said, we had we have over um, 200 NGO support right now. That's where we stand. We had a campaign launch um, just across the street from the UN headquarters in New York last November. Um, good that we did that last year, not this year, or else it would look a little bit differently. Um, but as, as far as um, member state support, those NGOs that are supporting us, we've prepared a template for them where they can then uh, reach out to their um, foreign ministries, to their, um, I mean, every government is different. So um, we just try to support them. We give them the templates that they need then to reach out to the, um, to the correct representative in their government so to know about this idea, first of all, just to get it on the table um, to know that there is chatter about it and that there is support um, in the NGO world. Um, and what, uh, as far as how that would work, petition-wise, the real technicalities of it, um, because it is, it, it is based on the European Citizens Initiative, so we do have a, a basis of how it could look like practically, uh, but of course the EU is different than the UN. For the EU, it's one million signatures within one year, and there's a, a threshold of at least seven member states. It's going to look different at the UN. Um, what we did do is we commissioned a legal paper um, to two legal experts. One is a European Citizens Initiative expert, and one is an expert, a legal expert of the UN and the two of them put their brains together and they really put together a paper of how this can legally and practically look. Well the good news is legally it is possible. There are articles in the UN Charter that say um, this kind of um, really organized petition really could work at the UN level so that's the good news um, but if you really want to know the details of how that can look like this is just what these two experts they put their brains together. I can also put the link in, in that in the chat and so you can have a look at this. You can download the study for free. Fantastic. Thank you, Daniela. Yeah, I think that would be uh, really appreciated to, to see that link and, and I'm sure that the team will be happy to share it afterwards as well. Um, okay, so I think it's time to go to our next uh, question, which uh, is another potential channel for engaging. So we've heard there are one channel, which is a, uh, a citizens initiative. Another channel that's being proposed is to have a high level focal point for civil society inside the UN. Um, and that person would be there to make the UN more responsive and effective to respond to people's needs. So. Do you think that's a good idea? Do we need a high level focal point inside the UN? Uh, again, the, uh, the options are that you agree, you disagree, or if you're not sure, you can say it's, uh, it's complicated. Um, so this, this is a, another proposal that has been floated as a possible way to engage people more directly, to have a specific entry point so that we know uh, as civil society where we go, if we wanna get through uh, to the UN. And this would be someone presumably who would have access across the agencies of the UN. And I think we'll be hearing more about how that might work in just a minute. So just five seconds more, cast your vote if you haven't done so already. Okay, and time is up. Well, this one is a, a much clearer result, I think, um, and Unsurprisingly, it seems most of us are in favor of this, uh, or most of you, actually, I haven't voted. Um, so I'd like to open it up now to our next speaker, uh, Fergus Watt, who is the executive director from the World Federalist Movement and has been one of the leading lights of the UN 2020 campaign. Uh, and this idea is one of those within the UN 2020 campaign. But Fergus, maybe you'd like to tell us a bit more about the campaign and, and how this idea of focal point might work. Sure. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, the UN 2020 campaign is a civil society led campaign that seeks to use the opportunity of the 75th anniversary uh, for much needed stock taking, uh, not only recognition of achievements, but also consideration of, of ways that strengthen the organization. Um, even before the beginning of the, the pandemic, multilateralism was under threat and weakened by withdrawals from important treaties and forums, budget cuts, and, and uh, the failure by many governments to uphold international law. Uh, COVID-19 has further underscored humanity's shared vulnerability and, and the need for more, not less, international cooperation. Uh, recovery from the pandemic and in institutional reforms go hand in hand. We need to build back better, not just nationally, but also internationally. Uh, and, and this requires leadership. 
so that's, that's the main message of, of the UN 2020 campaign. Uh, the, on May uh, 14, 15, uh, uh, we held a, the UN 75 People's Forum for the UN We Need. And this brought together over 600 civil society participants each day from 75 countries around the world. And it launched a, a UN 75 People's Declaration um, entitled Humanity at a Crossroads, Gro Global Solutions for Global Challenges, uh, which was presented at the, at the event uh, to Mr. Um, Tijani Mohammed Bandi, the president of this year's General Assembly. And he later had the documents circulated to all UN missions. I'll place, uh, um, once I finish my remarks, I'll place the, the link to the People's Declaration in the chat box. Um, it is open for endorsement either by individuals on this call or those representing organizations. And we will be uh, uh, releasing it again at UNGA Week. So I hope that uh, those listening here can, can uh, consider endorsing the People's Declaration. Um, now regarding the, in general, UN 2020 just calls for a, um, you know, a, a process of, of revisiting multilateralism and considering a range of ways to strengthen the UN system. But um, we also do get into the weeds of some particular pragmatic or, or far-reaching uh, proposals. We also support the World Citizens Initiative, by the way, Danielle. And, uh, but but the, on, the, on the question of a, a high-level focal point, um, I think it's clear that despite their many contributions to global governance, civil society groups face repeated challenges, uh, shrinking space, not just at, at, in many national contexts, but at the global decision-making level. And a secretary, as a secretary general appointment, uh, the idea of a focal point could be implemented fairly soon. Um, and it, as a, it would be a high level uh, office within the secretariat and it would give uh, legitimacy and credibility to the, uh, the expectation that civil society is, a, is an instrumental partner of the UN system. Uh, we all know that uh, many of the institutional innovations and treaty innovations that have succeeded in, in uh, uh, recent years have been uh, the result of uh, collaboration between governments and civil society, whether we're talking about the International Criminal Court, uh, Landmines Treaty, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The SDGs are a much better uh, um, set of, of development goals Thanks. So I guess that, that is, that's a perfect place. I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap you up there. I think we were already over your, your three minutes and that was oh, a perfect sorry. place to, 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 to wrap up, if you don't mind, just that point sure. around civil society pressure achieving real change within the UN. Because um, our next speaker I know has experience of this uh, from a firsthand uh, experience and that is John Romano, uh, the coordinator of the TAP Network, who was extremely active as many of us know, back in the Rio plus 20 negotiations and during the SDG negotiations in 2015. Um, so John, how do you see civil society voices really driving that change? And, and do you see the focal point as one way to give uh, people better access? Over to you, John. Great, yep, thanks a lot, Ali. Um, my response, I, I cheated a little bit on the survey. I, I would have responded, uh, yes, it's a great idea, uh, but it's complicated. I think, uh, you know, as with any of these um, initiatives, I think, yeah, the, uh, the initial idea behind it is great. I think those of us that have worked around the UN know that we need better transparency and engagement of the UN and member states with not just civil society and the usual suspects, you know, those of us that are able to attend, you know, all these forums every year, but with people um, at the national and local level. So the idea is great, um, but there are some potential risks that I think we do need to be aware of and think of as we look to take this forward. I mean, the, the first is that, um, you know, this office or this representative needs to be well-funded. Um, I think it's very easy in the UN system to marginalize an office or, an entity by just withdrawing funding from it. Uh, and especially when competition for funding is so uh, high at, uh, around the UN system, uh, it's an obvious risk. Um, and then again, also if it's 
hosted within the Secretariat and funded by the UN's core budget. The question could be asked, you know, who is this person or office accountable to? Uh, is it member states who are in, re responsible for the budget and, and paying uh, the bill here, or is it civil society and the people? Um, I think uh, that points to another point. We need this to have complete independence and complete transparency uh, and have, it, have this individual be able to speak out when needed. And I think having something in the UN, I think sometimes, um, and speaking from experience a little bit here as well, um, you know, the Secretariat and, and UN agencies sometimes don't often have that capacity. Um, there are political implications for, um, you know, sticking their neck out there sometimes. So maybe exploring maybe a hybrid, hybrid solution, having an independent organization play this role, something like that, or uh, having an advisory council, something where civil society is still represented through this office or through this individual and still able to contribute on a regular basis, um, I think could be, um, you know, um, uh, kind of a hybrid solution. Uh, another risk is that, you know, with all of the politicking around the UN, some governments um, nominate their own representatives as heads of agencies um, in, in a lot of cases. So there's an obvious risk that a government that wants to undermine this office could uh, promote and um, kind of put in their own people uh, into this office, which is also an obvious risk. And then finally, I mean, with civil society being so diverse and operating at so many levels, I think uh, the expectations on this one individual or office would be sky high, I think. And there's a question about how do we ensure that this person or office uh, actually adequately uh, reflects the, the views of civil society, particularly those that don't engage at the UN so often. Um, so I think we'd have to find ways about, you know, what's the focus? Is it at the global level or is it at the national and local level um, where we really need those inputs and the engagement the most? So uh, a lot of questions we could talk about this for, for hours, but um, yeah, those are just some potential risks, but it's, a, it's still a great idea, obviously. Thanks so much, John. Um, and really interesting, given you've got accountability in your network, that that is the key point you've raised. And I can see how that how that really plays out in terms of who is that person accountable to? How are they selected? Really, really good points. So maybe we should put some of those questions back to Fergus. I know we had to cut you off a little bit early, Fergus. How would you see that accountability working? How would we make sure that voice remains independent? I think you're still muted, Fergus. Sorry. Um, many of John's points, uh, uh, they're, all, they're all bang on and, and they had a familiar ring because uh, UN 2020 campaigns sponsored uh, two in-depth workshops on, on this uh, to try and address some of the, the obstacles and the challenges and you know, think about how we might move this forward. That was the, the workshops uh, uh, included civil society and UN officials and, and, and many of these uh, um, uh, challenges um, arose. Um, one interesting idea uh, is, is uh, incorporating civil society representatives in the governance of the office so that it wouldn't just be uh, something that is, that is uh, um, uh, you know, that, that would be uh, France or Sweden or, or South Africa's uh, uh, position in, in, in the same way that France, for example, controls UN peacekeeping and always appoint, appoints the head of, of the Department of Peace Operations. Um, another another uh, structural uh, uh, way to build in some of these uh, safeguards would be to uh, have a group of states fund the office, not one. But, you know, for the, the worst example that came up in our in our workshops was the uh, the youth envoy being funded by uh, the government of Saudi Arabia. Um, you don't want one government controlling uh, the focal point. So you uh, you know a range of funders. Uh, the the feeling is that if it came from the regular budget, it it uh, it would be vulnerable. Um, so it and 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 it, that's also hard to get agreement on in an age of of uh, uh, cost reductions at the UN. So the more likely um, way to have this funded is through uh, voluntary contributions. But better that you have uh, a, a diverse group of states funding it. Um, there were other risks that we flagged in our in our workshop. I mean, there's a risk of bureaucratic capture. Um, you know, the UN the UN uh, does partnerships with 
with a, a range of uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, business to indigenous, and 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 you know, would this office get mixed in or or somehow uh, a kind of a muddled mandate, and and that would need to be protected against as well. So, uh, John is right. There 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 are complications, but the idea is is in in principle sound. It's not a new idea. It was first proposed with the two thousand and four um, Cardozo report, and and. Uh, um, you know, it, the Gillian Sorensen was uh, uh, a representative uh, of the Secretariat uh, uh, for Civil Society in the Kofi Annan era, but that that position was not continued. So it's it's something that that's that's sort of been off and on and and uh, could be revived. And in an age when when we really need, you know, we know that civil society is a catalyst to a better UN. So um, we think it's it's something that would that would leverage wider. Uh, progressive change. Thanks, thanks, Fergus. Um, so, John, just coming back to you for one one more comment on this. I mean, do, do you would you be able to partly answer your own question? I mean, how would you see, for example, budgets that already exist, say, in the Human Rights Council or in UN DESA? I mean, how would you see this potential new office interacting with those existing bodies that already deal with civil society? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a fair point, too, is that, um, you know, there are a lot of individual focal points, you know, for civil society around different UN agencies and different processes. So there's a lot to already build upon. Um, but I think those of us that work with those offices already know that even those offices are com continuously overstretched and um, lacking in funding and support and mandate. Um, so I think yeah, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a question of do we support what's already there and in, invest in that and, and look to build that up more? Um, or, you know, do we look to supplement that with an additional office? And I think the answer is kind of it's both. Um, I think the, the real challenge for us, I think, being a little bit self-critical as civil society here is that, you know, we focus a lot on the ask and the advocacy to get to a point. I think the implementation of it, I think, is when we get a lot of the support falling off and i think if if we're if we're to take this forward and and actually make sure that it makes an impact on the un system and and on you know multilateralism overall uh, i think we need to actually amplify uh, this message and 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 work even harder once we start to get some of that momentum um, and start to get some some buy-in for this uh, we need to then push and push and push for more transparency more funding, I think, as Fergus mentioned, uh, we do need a diversity of donors. We need um, a, a multiplicity of actors engaged in the governance and the implementation of this. Um, yeah, again, you could we could really talk about this for hours and UN 2020 has done so already. So um, I think the, the message is we still have to keep pushing even when we get uh, this idea and this concept um, agreed or um, gain some momentum around it. Uh, I think we need to to even push even even harder and looking forward to helping doing that. Great. Well, thank you to both of those interventions. And, and uh, there's clearly uh, some momentum building around this idea, and I'm sure um, we'll be in touch again to share further thoughts on it. Um, I'd like to move us on now to the next uh, poll. Uh, we seem to spend our lives now on Zoom. So the question is, do you think that virtual UN sessions are more inclusive than in-person meetings? Um, so as I'm sure all of you, uh, we have been spending hours of our time in virtual meetings. Um, do these virtual meetings actually allow for more diverse voices to be heard? Uh, do you agree, disagree, or again, do you think it's complicated? I guess the, the interesting thing here is that on one level, more people can log in you know we can have many more people in one meeting um but has that actually led to a more inclusive process be good to hear and we're going to have two speakers talk us through this in just a minute so just uh, about 10 seconds left if you haven't voted please do please do so um getting quite okay getting close to time now and this has been particularly true. Okay, we have finished now. Okay, and now you can see the results. There we go. So it seems 
interesting a lot of people do think it it leads to some improvements but then a lot also saying it's complicated so um the two who we have now the next speaker is uh Lian Aldani I hope I've pronounced that correctly from the Access Center for Human Rights um Lian is a Syrian researcher with extensive experience on social research uh, has been working with refugees in many fields uh, and has received um, the U.S. Uh, MEPI Tomorrow, Tomorrow's Leaders Graduate Scholarship, has really been someone who's been uh, working on the ground and bringing diverse voices into the, into the UN process. So, Lian, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, thank you so much, all. And um, um, so far, I'm, I'm really glad with all your, your inputs on, um, on the polls that, uh, that already passed. Um, for this question, when I, when I read it, I was like, yeah, it is a very easy thing to answer. I totally agree. I immediately fully agree with it. However, later when I thought about it, I found that we, like, I agree, I personally agree to an extent that um, visual events are more engaging nowadays than in person, person one, in person ones. So allow me here uh, to start with the positive side of of these, and then you you will have the um, the margin to judge. Um, with online virtual events, not only the that the UN is holding, but all international agencies, it's it's actually it's giving more space for NGOs uh, to be included in the debate and the discussion and to be even included in the, uh, in the recommendations of process making. And in addition, uh, it also um, actually included grassroots level organizations. For example, uh, when we talk about conflict zones or war zones, like in Syria, we do not see grassroots level organizations represented in in-person events in New York, in Geneva, in Brussels. So with the online meetings, it gave them uh, this luxury to be present and participate and have their voices heard. Um, however, um, however, back when it was in person, they were not granted the luxury to travel and even if they were offered this they were collided with the visa process and the lengthy uh, thing in order to escape the Middle East and go abroad and and, and you know the, the struggle here so so now it for the grassroots level it became more engaging um, on the on the other side on the other side, it is more um, it's more engaging on the budget level. Uh, NGOs now do not have to pay or do not have to travel all the way to other countries and do not have action to allocate budget for this. So it is more um, uh, relaxing, it's more chilling for these. And however, the negative thing why I, I, I said it is complicated is, is that we lost the sense of diplomacy and interaction in person. Really, these virtual events do not give us the margin to interact in person and to expand our professional network so much together and to get to know each other well. So we lost the sense of uh, diplomacy. And the second thing we lost is that political negotiations are now totally 100% under the table and under light. And this is something that we NGOs and even humanitarian sector would like to observe in person and to know um, how the perspectives are being, how negotiations are going, um, what sides are, what political sides are taking each other. And, and people may tell me that, uh, that it already happens under the table and under light. Yes, it is true. The consensus already happens over there. However, back then in person when we were in person there we used actually to see to absorb the perspectives to observe the negotiation and this is what we lost on the online meeting and I hope that that countries would not uh, I'm gonna stop in a bit I hope uh, countries would not actually uh, take this for granted and decide and do um, a, a risky uh, negotiations on their people hopefully thank you so much Thanks. Thank you, Lian, and thank you for highlighting both the, the pros and cons. Um, and next to guide us through this is a good friend, um, Alessandra Nilo, uh, the coordinator of Gestos in Brazil, um, and is, she's also the coordinator of the um, working group on the 2030 agenda in Brazil, so has a lot of experience in negotiating with governments and the UN. Alessandra, do you think this is working better with online formats? How do you see it working? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Oli. Uh, I will speak in Spanish to bring some diversity to this conversation. 
Entonces, uh, yo pienso que es una buena oportunidad para aumentar la inclusión, pero eh, tenemos que considerar que son diferentes, muy diferentes las modalidades que hablamos. Una cosa es la inclusión en modalidades de negociación. Otra cosa es la inclusión en debates que son debates temáticos, de debates públicos, que en ese sentido pienso que sí, que hay una pequeña mejora por las cuestiones que Lyon ya habló antes. Todavía la preocupación es que en los procesos ahora de definición, de negociación, definición de modalidades que tienen que ver realmente con los temas más duros, el proceso está, más, está menos transparente. Entonces, el hecho, hay un hecho real de menos, menor transparencia en cómo los procesos para definición de los panelistas, de los temas, de la manera como se va a avanzar, es puesto en cena ahora. Estamos con menor transparencia, pienso, en relación a ese proceso. También es muy importante decir que la cuestión de accesibilidad de las Naciones Unidas es muy variable porque es importante tener la conexión con los grassroots, pero al mismo tiempo lo que resulta es que tenemos que tener en conciencia que Naciones Unidas es compuesta por Estados miembros y si no les damos la lucha para mejoría de la participación dentro de esos Estados miembros, las decisiones de Naciones Unidas reflejen esas posiciones nacionales. Entonces, quiero decir y enfatizar mucho ese tema vinculado a las discusiones anteriores que muestran cómo, por ejemplo, ya estábamos detrás en términos de participación. Tanto que el año pasado entregamos a Guterres algunos pedidos. Por ejemplo, la constitución de un grupo de referencia, como tuvo Fernando Enrique Cardoso, para discutir exactamente la disminución de espacios de participación de la sociedad civil en las Naciones Unidas. Pedimos también la creación de un fondo internacional vinculado a Naciones Unidas para tener la participación de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil. Y también pedimos que en los espacios de gobernanza de las agencias de Naciones Unidas, de los cuerpos de las Naciones Unidas, fuera posible la inclusión de la sociedad civil en los consejos directivos de esos espacios, como se pasa, por ejemplo, con la Organización Mundial de Trabajo y, y con ONU-SIDA, por ejemplo, que tiene, de hecho, la participación, mecanismos formales de participación de la sociedad civil en esos espacios. Entonces, esa pregunta se puede contestar de diferentes maneras, a depender de qué tipo de modalidades estamos hablando. No hay una respuesta para todas esas modalidades, pero de verdad que podríamos aprovechar mucho la posibilidad de tener y mantener algunos de los espacios virtuales mientras otros necesitan ser presenciales porque no hay nada como estar en un espacio entendiendo el contexto político y tener la oportunidad de levantar la mano y decir, bueno, quiero hablar o, o identificar alguna oportunidad que de verdad eh, de relación y acción bilateral y multilateral que el espacio virtual no nos no deja. Entonces, para empezar esa conversa, empezaría por ahí. Muy bien, perfecto. Muchas gracias, Alessandra. Uh, so, I think it's extremely useful to have those two uh, different uh, views on how things are working. Um, now perhaps I, I don't see too many questions yet in the chat. Please do feel free to add uh, questions. Don't forget that you do have the chat function uh, and we'll make sure that we can raise those. Uh, I can see there's a comment on the CSO focal point, but nothing specifically yet on this question. Um, perhaps I'll put something then to, to Leon. Um, I was really interested in what you mentioned, Leon, about how the virtual format meant that some of the negotiations were actually less visible. Um, I wondered if you could just explain a bit more about what you mean. Is, is that to do with the lack of um, ability to join certain calls, the fact that it's all uh, through password protected Zooms? I mean, what, what is it that's making it harder for people to engage? Okay, um, when I talked about the virtual events being hard in order to interact in a diplomacy way, what I was meaning here is that now we are sitting in this conference, okay? But we do not have the luxury once we leave the meeting to go and interact with, with each other, okay? Alone, like, like other than the event, like in an in informal way. So this is what we lost 
through these virtual meetings, we're not having the luxury even to interact, to expand on our professional network, to exchange experience in an informal way. You know that these are very crucial when you go to any international conference or when you attend any consultations abroad. It's very crucial to interact with the people on coffee breaks, on, on lunches, on um, either, even in the lobby. So with these virtual events, we lost this luxury, unfortunately. But this does not mean that we're not gonna, we are losing contact with each other, but we are losing the sense of interaction. And this is what I meant um, when I talked about this point. Great. No, that's really clear. And actually that ties in with, I think many of us know, um, Felix Dodds had written a book about how the uh, SDGs were negotiated over a cup of coffee in the Vienna Cafe. So I think I understand what you're getting at there um, and how important those uh, informal chats can be. Um, but Alessandra, coming to your um, point that you highlighted, the proposal for a fund to enable more civil society voices to be heard, um, how would you see that working? And I mean, do you think there's also a challenge with connectivity for people living, say, in the interior of Brazil who may not even be able to get online? How, how do we break down some of those boundaries? Yeah, definitely it is. Uh, there is a lack of capacity for civil society in general to, to engage in the process if we are going to depend on accessibility. But at the same time, when I think about the UN, I, I believe that it would be easier for us to overcome the lack of accessibility when we are speaking about access to technologies than to overcome the lack of capacity to go to the UN and to participate in person in, in such meetings. So that's why I'm saying that we need now to figure out what are the modalities and for each modality to figure out how would be the best way to engage people. I don't think there will be one, one, one recipe that will fit to everything, you know? So even when you think about one person representing civil society, this liaison person, well, let's see that. It's, are we talking about one person? Are we talking about a group of people representing different regions, different voices and constituencies that will help us to have this dialogue with the UN? The fund for doing that, it must exist and it must be independent. I don't want to have any governments defining who will be the civil society, able or not to participate and to engage. But again, how can we deal with the situation that we have more obstructed um, countries obstruct, obstructing our participation at the UN? If we continue with that trend at national level, the UN will continue with the trend of diminishing the participation of civil society. It is natural. UN is not a civil society body. It is a multi-stakeholder body mainly member states and of course we understand the state as something where civil society has a space to say has uh, the the right to participate etc cetera, etc cetera. but in the way it is interpreted at the national level what i'm saying is we will also imply the international level finally only i think we need to have a more united voice among our civil society in terms of how to deal with that because every time we sit together, we have different ideas, we have different suggestions, and we don't follow up on the you know, old suggestions that we brought. So it seems that we are trying to adapt without really saying, this is our agenda. We want to, to move forward with that. So it, it's a very interesting moment for us to discuss more about what is democracy and how a de more democratic world will you impact on the, the trend, the current trend against multilateralism, which is what we are facing now. And, and it just uh, end up in restricting our participation in many, many, many spaces. Thank you, Alessandra. And that's a really good reminder to us all on how we can work together in these extremely tough times, as you say. And uh, next week, don't forget, and I'll remind people at the end as well, it's the week of action globally, where we can highlight some of those actions that people are taking, like in Brazil, like in India, and other countries where civil society is standing up and uh, delivering on our own solutions, even 
uh, in the face of uh, difficult uh, challenges from, from governments in many cases. Um, so I think that's a good point to lead on to the next question, which is around um, human rights more directly. Um, so we know that the UN Secretary General put out a call to action on human rights in February of 2020. Um, the question is, how far do we think this has led to tangible changes in how the UN agencies function? So following the UN Secretary General's call in February 2020, his call to action on human rights, have there been tangible changes in how the UN agencies function? So if you agree that it has led to tangible changes, and it's only been a few months, um, of course, but if you agree that this has already led to changes, then tick agree. If you disagree, or if you think it's complicated, uh, those are your choices again. Um, it's, it's obviously been a, a very challenging time, but we have seen a call to action on human rights from the UN Secretary General, and this is to get a sense of whether you think that's having an impact on the agencies of the UN. So just five seconds to go. Okay, time's up. And I think we're going to share. There we go. So this one, it seems there's uh, a lot of people think it's complicated. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how our panelists respond on this one. Um, clearly, civic space is under threat in so many countries, as Alessandra has just highlighted. Um, human rights are under threat and um, we do need the UN to stand up. Um, so it would be interesting to hear now from our next speaker, um, Yolette Etienne, who's the country director of ActionAid Haiti, who has uh, direct experience on the ground in terms of human rights situations and the potential for the UN agencies to work with civil society. Um, Yolette, we'd love to hear from you on your experiences. Merci. Donc, c'était très intéressant de participer à ce forum. Ça coupe l'isolement de notre pays. Parce que très souvent, effectivement, nous faisons partie des Nations Unies, mais la majorité des citoyens et des citoyennes ne le savent pas. Et certaines fois, les institutions envoient aussi des messages mixtes. Par exemple, si je prends le cas de Haïti aujourd'hui, quand il y a un message de, de, de la BINU, qui est censée être une instance des Nations Unies dans le pays pour appuyer, on sent que c'est le même message qu'envoient les États-Unis ou ce qu'on appelle la communauté internationale. Et cela va dans un sens qui ne supporte pas nécessairement les droits humains. Je suis venue aujourd'hui encore choquée parce que quand on est en 2021 et que des femmes dénoncent des abus sexuels ou des agressions ou des viols et être attaquées et être considérées comme des organisations terroristes, c'est terrible. Et savoir où on peut trouver un recours, c'est extrêmement compliqué. Parce que encore aujourd'hui, quand des femmes essaient timidement de dénoncer des accusations, des viols dont elles ont, qu'elles ont subi, quand elles essaient de prendre la parole, alors que ça se passe au niveau de différents pays, et entendre un ministre de gouvernement dénoncer et accuser les femmes d'avoir un laboratoire et les comparer à des organisations terroristes. C'est terrible. Et justement, on sent que dans un tout petit pays comme Haïti, normalement, c'est pour ça que nous croyons au multilatéralisme et à la question multilatérale, à ces espaces des Nations Unies, où normalement, ça a été créé pour que ça soit un vote, une voix, des espaces pour encourager la solidarité, des espaces où on peut, au-delà des nations, réclamer et savoir qu'on puisse avoir un recours. Et c'est vrai, particulièrement pour la situation des femmes et les, les, les progrès réalisés au niveau, au niveau global, les déclarations, les accords pris au niveau global ont une répercussion et soutiennent les initiatives qui peuvent se prendre dans un pays. C'est cela que nous attendons des Nations Unies, c'est cela que nous attendons pour pousser le respect des droits humains. Et justement, et quand ces organisations sont marginalisées, c'est important de savoir qu'on a des espaces au niveau global pour pouvoir les soutenir. Et des pays comme Haïti aujourd'hui, la perception générale, c'est que ces instances se mettent plutôt du gouvernement, se mettent plutôt du côté du plus fort, et il n'y a pas vraiment un espace pour promouvoir le droit, ce qui est légal et la légitimité. Et comme je l'ai dit, ça tient aux organisations paysannes, aux organisations de base, mais également aux organisations de femmes. On ne peut pas dire que nous vivons aujourd'hui le 21e siècle. Comme je vous le dis, les organisations de femmes ou les femmes qui osent dénoncer sont sous la menace. Et ceci, ce n'est pas seulement en Haïti. Au Guatemala, la situation est pareille. Au, 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 au Zimbabwe, aujourd'hui, la situation est extrêmement difficile. 
mais on a besoin de ces espaces multilatéraux pour savoir qu'on a le recours et le soutien parce qu'on parle beaucoup de droits humains, de droits des femmes, de droits des hommes, de droits de toutes les catégories et des minorités. Mais on sait également que c'est difficile parce que les Nations Unies ont moins de moyens, ils sont attaqués, mais c'est important de continuer à ce sens. Merci. Merci, merci bien, Yolette. Uh, c'est bien reçu. Um, It's a very, very challenging situation. I think some of the points that have been raised there in terms of direct violations are still happening. Um, and it's clear that uh, the feeling is that the UN is, uh, has not been able to do enough. Um, it would be interesting now to hear from Memory Kachambwa from Femnet, who has over 18 years experience working across the African continent, um, the African Women's Development and Communications Network, Uh, she's also on the board of the Female Student Support Network Trust in Zimbabwe and is co-chair of the SDGs Kenya Forum. Uh, Memory, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Oli. And I think I'll just take on from where you led left and also say that um, I think one of the clearest and strongest message that came out from the call of action is the recognition of the fundamental issue of upholding Um, human rights by the UN, which is their mandate in any case. And I think this is really coming a bit too late. Um, after all, what this in a way also echoes what we have been calling for, particularly in the way the UN should be reformed and the UN should be working um, right to the, to the grassroots level. I think it also uh, talks about the collective determination that uh, for this call of action to really reform the way UN works, it should also look at undergo, UN should undergo its own internal transformation. And the, I really like the seven principles that the Secretary General underlined, but I think most of them, if you pick one, for example, on issues around climate justice, we have been really grieving to the damage of our planet and people's lives Um, how this whole has been really diminished by the issues around globalization, the issues also that we call about neoliberal liberalization and the whole economic infrastructure. And really this has had a huge impact, but we have not really seen um, the UN, even in the few months, taking bold actions to really transform and to stand up against uh, some of the atrocities across not just Africa, but we have seen in Africa increasing extractivism. We've seen um, countries which are taking advantage of this lockdown situation and really um, having deals with the different, um, yes, with, with the different governments. I think the UN Secretary General, um, has also needs to ensure for this to be achieved, there has to be investment. So for example, I'll, quick, I'll, I'll say quickly, the UN entity, UN Women, still receives one of the lowest budgets. So we haven't seen much shift in that. Uh, we've also seen that another principle, which is around um, the shrinking civic space, but we still know that unless the UN reforms the way uh, things will work. Young women, particularly from Africa, are still denied participation in the UN, which is based in New York in the US, access to, to attend because of visas. We've also seen the UN not taking a strong stand within just this short six months. The issues where we have big powers that are restricting funding for sexual reproductive health and rights, for example. So for the call of action to have full weight, um, it will not be possible unless fundamental shifts in power and we really see human, human rights defenders being um, boldly supported, UN coming out. So we do know in our, I'm sorry, Brista, I know it's time up, But I just have to say this, that we know in our hearts, we know in our bodies that the current way the UN is structured within the global architecture 
built on a patriarchal base is wrong. It's not sustainable. It will not deliver this call for action. So to truly make tangible results and right at the center as articulated by the Secretary General in this call, there must be fundamental shift in dealing with power, underlying inequalities, and being bold to uphold the rights. So we expect much more um, from the rhetoric that is in this call for action. Thank you. Thank you, Memory. Very strong words indeed. And uh, I think there are some very clear recommendations there. It's a shame uh, Natalie has had to jump off, but we will also make sure this is fed back through the various UN representatives. Um, Yolette, you mentioned in, your, in the chat here the importance of opening up the UN space for uh, more diverse voices, for uh, people who are directly experiencing uh, challenges to be able to speak out. How, how would you see that working, Yolette? Action aide a quand même eu des exemples très intéressants. C'est permettre aux gens réellement de faire entendre leur voix, de justement cette histoire de représentation. Quand il y a une femme paysanne ou une femme qui a subi, effectivement, moi qui suis dans une ONG, j'essaie de représenter, mais les gens ouvrir cet espace aux organisations locales. Dans un pays comme Haïti, si on prend par exemple l'équipe humanitaire pays, il n'y a que des ONG internationales qui participent. Je sais qu'il y a des efforts qui sont faits, mais les organisations nationales ne profitent pas, ne connaissent pas cet espace, ne connaissent pas très bien. C'est déjà ça, hein, au niveau des pays, assurer effectivement que ces espaces sont ouverts aux organisations locales et aux vraies personnes qui vivent les situations. Et également, aux des représentations globales. Alors, tantôt, on l'a dit, peut-être qu'au niveau virtuel, ça pourrait aider, c'est un élément technologique qui pourrait nous permettre de nous étendre, bien qu'on sache que ces organisations n'ont pas accès à la technologie, mais, et qu y a, mais au moins les problèmes de visa, ou si on, leur, on essaie de, quand même de ménager des espaces où plusieurs organisations peuvent se retrouver, leur permettre d'écouter ce message global, de savoir ce qui existe au niveau international comme accord, et de faire entendre leur voix. Moi, je crois que ce sont ces deux éléments, que les gens soient au courant des accords et qu'il y ait une dissémination de ces informations, et s'assurer que dans les espaces nationaux, les instances des, des, des Nations Unies permettent aux organisations locales d'être présentes et qui, et qui, parce qu'elles sont majoritaires, elles sont dans le pays, elles doivent être là et en même temps leur donner, leur permettre d'avoir les ressources nécessaires pour participer au forum virtuel qui pour moi de toute façon c'est quand même une ouverture et une grande opportunité. Excellent. Thank you, Yolette. Very practical, tangible steps that are being proposed. Um, and Memory, coming back to you, um, I, I think you, we, we have a question that's come from Annie um, saying that the threat to human rights defenders and those who are the most vulnerable is increasing, but the UN doesn't always have the capacity to mandate governments. So how do we balance that? How, how, what, what can we expect from the UN? How can the UN uh, play its role even with limited budgets? So I think this is the question which goes into complicated, <laughs> that I think this is really complicated. Uh, and the UN Secretary General's call for action boldly gives the UN that mandate. And I think this is the reason why we have the UN, to be able to stand between the states and the, and, 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 and the civil society and the civics. So this is why we have an entity called the UN. So if the UN is not bold enough, and regardless, I think sometimes it's not a matter of resources, because if you think of resources as being financial, but the UN has a mandate um, to actually moderate, to mediate, but to also stand up and really have a statement to say, this is against the UN, the, the fundamental human rights principles. So all the principles that we are pushing for in Geneva, those are the principles, it could be from workers' rights all the way to, to fundamental civic constitutional rights. So the UN is well positioned. And the, and the Secretary General in his call for action is actually calling the UN to do that. So I think 
with the increasing um, human rights violations, I think this is a, a, a point in time where instead of the UN calling, having a call for action, it should be actually actioning itself. It should be the one really standing up right now and supporting all the Human Rights Watch, supporting Amnesty, um, really supporting, um, because that's his mandate. So I think it's also our responsibility to hold the UN to this call, because when we see human rights defenders on the front line every single day, and the UN is silent, they're implicit to not upholding this very strong progressive call. I don't know if that answers it, but the UN just has to do what it has to do. I, I think that's very clear, memory, and, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a very strong message that we all need to take back to the UN, as you say, to uh, deliver on, on those promises. Absolutely. Um, and actually, that takes us neatly to the final poll of today. Um, and this goes back to some of the early debates about whether we think we can change things within the current system or whether we need to be even bolder. So the United Nations needs a fundamental revamp in its public engagement as opposed to making improvements to existing processes. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Or do you think it's complicated? So here we're really asking if you think it's possible just to tweak things around a little bit, um, to modify a couple of the existing uh, processes, or if we're serious about changing things, do we need uh, a more fundamental revamp, a rethink in how civil society engages with the UN? So this, this in a way, uh, encapsulates a lot of the earlier discussions we've had. We've talked about different potential avenues for change. Um, but here, just to, to close us off, we want to know how radical should we be? Should we just go for something completely fresh? Or can we change things within the existing model? So one, two seconds, that's it. OK, we have run out of time. There we go. Well, I think that's a pretty resounding agreement on this one. People on this call, at least, are keen to see a much more radical change. So that leads us really nicely to our last couple of speakers to talk us through this. Um, so next we have uh, Beverly, Beverly Longid, who is a co-chair of the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness, CPDE, uh, and is also a strong activist in her own right in the indigenous people's movement in the Philippines. Um, and is also the coordinator of the International Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation. So, Beverly, over to you. Um, thank you, Oli. Um, good, uh, good evening to everybody. Yes, I agree. No? The United Nations needs a fundamental revamp in its uh, public in, uh, engagement. In fact, this is a constant debate, uh, especially on the recomposition of the Security Council and its veto powers, adequate funding by developed countries, and genuine promotion of democracy and uh, human rights. And I think for the UN to effectively address you know, the global challenges such as wars and forced displacement, poverty and hunger, increasing debt uh, burden and unemployment, the worsening attacks on human rights, on media freedom and civil society, it needs to instill meaningful reforms. No? Um, however, despite the pronouncements at the highest level of the UN leadership that civil, civil society engagement remains limited, very limited, if not an afterthought no, at the UN, our engagement in the UN, I think, should not simply be an end goal. It must fit also the reality that change should and also happen at the national and local levels. Um, the governance of the UN uh, needs to be more inclusive but this must be complemented with the same level of inclusion at country level. This is a real challenge and this is where the, I think, no, where the effectiveness uh, agenda, particularly the enabling environment for civil society and the issue of civil, civic space are most critical. Relating this to the last uh, question number four, um, in this time of COVID, the states, no, uh, uh, implemented a military's approach to a medical problem. And I do agree that there is an absence of bold actions in relation to grave violations of human rights, such as what's happening in the, in the Philippines and elsewhere. 
So it's important you know, that in this revamp, the effectiveness principles of inclusivity, transparency, and accountability grounded in democratic ownership and focus on results should apply to how the UN conducts its engagements with civil society. And we should uh, relate this, I think, also to question number one on we the peoples. It's very unfortunate that the states actually misappropriated the term we the peoples because it works on the assumption that states or governments represent the people's interests, welfare, and aspirations. And we have seen by all uh, um, testimonies that there is much uh, lacking in this regard. So I think there are some recommendations that I would like to look into uh, as far as we need to strengthen um, inclusive partnerships uh, for devel development to ensure that civil society is being able to engage um, formally, and this has to be institutionalized, institutionalized at all levels of uh, uh, governance uh, at the UN. And uh, going back to question number three, uh, as far as um, the virtual sessions, this would also include support and uh, um, certain mechanisms no? and enabling laws and resources. Um, uh, last point, <laughs> uh, uh, while it's true that there are um, benefits to digital participation, but I think in our experience as indigenous peoples, this has quite been delimiting because of the lack of access to internet, the lack of knowledge in terms of technology and um, uh, in terms of technology and uh, applications. Now, as far as the focal point on CSO um, in the UN, in our case for indigenous peoples, discussions actually have been undertaken on our enhanced participation in the entire UN processes. And we are looking into similar to a focal point, considering establishing sort of a permanent observer status that will allow our duly elected representatives no, as communities, as nations, as organizations in different um, uh, processes. So I think the last point, there are many things that uh, we can draw on, especially on good practices of CSO participation and assertion of people's rights as far as dealing with the United Nations. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly, and thank you for some very uh, practical suggestions there as well in terms of specific steps um, that can be taken within the UN, um, and we'll hopefully come back to those in just a minute. Um, so now our final speaker, uh, Annie Namala, uh, who is the convener of Wadanatodo Abiyan, which is the National uh, Coalition for Civil Society in India. She's also the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Social Equity and Inclusion in India and has uh, a great depth of experience and knowledge of working with communities, particularly those most marginalized across India. So Annie, you have the closing, uh, closing remarks. Thank you. First of all, I would really like to appreciate uh, both Civicas and Action for Sustainable Development for really making it a very engaging process. I think it's been extremely engaging and interesting to look at all the you know, reflections on the various dimensions that we talked. So thank you for that. Uh, I think this final point is very, very clear what the mandate is. Uh, so how do we move about this? How do we go forward or how can we do that? In my opinion, I think the UN is still our best bet. If we look at various other forums, they are either limited to security or economic issues. You don't have the breadth and the kind of people's agenda, uh, you know, combining various dimensions like the UN has. Uh, and UN has also progressively shown that it can incorporate more and more people's agenda. So I feel UN is our best bet and we need to strengthen that. Secondly, I would feel like uh, with this pandemic and what's going on around the world on human rights and various things, it's time for the UN to come up with a new slogan. Like, you know, at one point in time, we had the slogan of workers of the world unite and it mobilized people like, you know, UN has hinted to it at the leave no one behind the vulnerable communities, but that's too theoretical and academic. So if they can really translate that into a good slogan, particularly at this time when you have so many of these vulnerable communities across the world coming together. I think it's a potential moment which the UN can uh, leverage it and move it forward with people and with communities and taking that leave no one behind principle uh, much more grounded. The third dimension I also want to 
uh, look at is see the un has to give a lot more value to public goods being provisioned by public agencies it cannot be supportive too much of the privatization agenda so how does the un actually stand up and say privatization for public goods is not really the solution to reach the most marginalized communities states have an accountability to public goods and that should be strengthened and that particular thing i think even in the kind of formats that come up with world agencies like uh, you know uh, various global agencies i think un will have to take a stand on saying you know privatization needs to be regulated in this manner and certain dimensions are out of private provisioning lastly i want to say that you know um, the national un agencies can do much more on strengthening civil society and the vulnerable communities at the national level it is not too costly uh, it is a role that they can play and i think that kind of a supportive role that the un can play at national agencies can uh, not just sustain civil society and our space but sustain the un itself uh, you know because that's their mandate and that's where they can really create a greater synergy and a facilitation process and that's where we still feel like second class citizens in the un i think the national agencies should change that to making civil society and the reach to the vulnerable communities their prime agenda thank you thank you very much anna that's uh, annie that's that's very strong and again i think we'll we'll come back on that final point you've just raised uh, in just just a minute but before we do let's come back to beverly um and beverly i wanted to give you a little bit more time on the specific recommendations you were making at the end there i think you mentioned for example more enabling laws and how the un might support that um you talked also about the access to internet proper provision of internet i don't know whether you could expand a little bit more on some of those practical steps that you proposed oh, well i was referring to the the issue of um, this digital participation because in our experience it's really been very delimiting um, for indigenous peoples who are in most of us are located in the rural areas and in fact even in these webinars that we have for the past months every now and then we would be having problems of people being cut not being able to to express themselves and i think um this should be given um support especially if in the next coming months most of the un engagements will be done virtually um in a sense those who have access to this those who are knowledgeable to this technology are the ones who can um, participate. In fact, um, getting an account in Zoom, it's probably very easy for many of us. But for many indigenous peoples, I mean, it's not as easy as we, uh, we think it is. Um, in the case of Asia, let's take the example of this online education, um, because much is really being done uh, uh, online. Um, families no, are, and schools are having problems because now you have to have different gadgets for each of your children to be able to participate in this um, uh, online education. So this kind of support, um, probably simple as it seems, but it's very, very um, significant and uh, very, very um, important. Second will be, uh, really, we do have to bridge the gap you now, which uh, on what is happening globally to what is happening at national level. I agree that the UN indeed came out with many covenants that will respect civil and political rights. There's a call to action for human rights. But then at national level, this means nothing if you do not have enabling laws that will implement these international human rights standards and international um, humanitarian law. And last, I think there's really much to be um, uh, revamp or change as far as national governments uh, are concerned. As I have mentioned, when we speak of we the, we the peoples, we don't speak of people in government who are largely probably belong to the local elite. We do not refer to the private sector representing corporate interests, but we refer to the interests, rights, and welfare of people on the ground. And these are probably the the, the, the peasants, the farmers, the workers, the youth, and, and, and the women. And these are the interests that government um, should stand for. 
So it's a complicated process, um, uh, but I think as we celebrate or commemorate or recall 75 years, we have 75 years of UN experience that we need really to assess and be able to draw up lessons and much really have to be, um, to be changed. And as far as CSOs are concerned, civil societies, I think there should be more a bigger or a stronger level of assertion on, on CSO engagement. No? Um, we should be able to challenge the existing narratives and, and limitations and really call for something beyond what the UN gives us as a matter of policy. Thank you, Beverly. Yes, rousing words to, to remind us of the need to really be bold. Um, so Annie, coming back to you on, on this question of how we, how we shift the UN, um, did you have any further thoughts? I, I was interested, you specifically mentioned the role of the resident coordinators or the, the national UN offices. Could you talk to us a bit more about that and how you see that might work in the future? Um, yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Oli. I think the UN agencies, particularly the resident coordinators office has a big role that they can play because they are the ones that can actually go and recognize because civil society organizations work with the vulnerable communities and it is easy to link to these civil society organizations and vulnerable communities at the national level. So if they can really create that space in their forums and in their processes uh, to highlight, to help these organizations articulate and then link them to the uh, you know, other uh, possibilities within the government. I think they do have a kind of a voice and space within the government which they can come in. Particularly, we realized that uh, in the VNR process in India this time, last year, Last time they had not engaged the civil society at all, but this time the UNRC office took an initiative and they created a space where we could uh, much more engage and work on the vulnerable communities, hold consultations. And that has become uh, quite an integrated part of our VNR report this time. So I would feel that on one hand, the RC office has the role. And the second, I would also like to think like, you know, how do we create a greater visibility for the Secretary General's call to action? I think civil society has a role that it can do there also, that there is a call from the Secretary General's office to the UN uh, human rights call. So how is our government standing up to something like that? So I think it is a two way process and can be mutually supportive uh, to both sides uh, at the country level. I Excellent. Thank you, Annie. And yes, I think uh, that was a very good example this year of how the uh, the VNR process in India actually did have that uh, much broader level of engagement uh, through a number of months. So, so we've had we've had an incredibly diverse uh, discussion here, and I think we've benefited from such a wealth of knowledge from all of the speakers. Um, and unfortunately, we're running out of time now. So it'd be very hard for me to try to conclude everything but but what I would say I think is that there's one of the key messages I think that, that I would take away and, and I hope we can continue to work on together is that there is uh, a, a dynamic interest in making sure and helping the UN to actually deliver on its original promises from 75 years ago the world is very different it is very challenging um, but what we can push for is that out of this challenging time, some new methods and some new approaches can emerge. And it sounds, you know, we, we actually have many of those solutions in, in this panel. Many people have got really practical ideas on how to improve the mechanisms within the UN. We just have to find the right allies, perhaps in the system there with the political will to actually implement some of these changes. So uh, it is an exciting and challenging time at the same time, both challenging and exciting. Um, but I hope that we can continue to all work together. Um, and I would li like to remind people as I did earlier that next week, well actually starting this Friday, we have a global week of action to coincide with the UN General Assembly. We'll be highlighting actions that groups are taking all around the world through social media, We'll be launching uh, the updated version of the scorecard based on the experiences uh, on the, the VNRs at the national level by civil society. 
We'll also be looking um, at the action zone. We'll have a number of frontline uh, faces speaking. Some, some of you will be familiar and we'll be looking at how we can continue to build on these dialogues in the coming months. So next week, yeah, turn it around is the hashtag. Global Week of Action to turn it around for people and planet. And I hope to continue to be in touch in various different formats in coming weeks. So I'll hand back to Bistra from Civicus to close us off. Thanks. Thank you, Oli, and thank you, everyone, for such a dynamic uh, discussion. We've had a lot of comments and a lot of conversations in the chat. Please make sure to grab the emails and contact numbers and links that were shared there. I think attendees very much enjoyed your conversation. As a last part, I wanted to launch the last poll for today, which is a short feedback survey question about this event. As I already mentioned in the beginning, this is part of a series of virtual events that we are hosting as part of the International Civil Society Week 2020-2021 on the topic of people power. Please do subscribe to the newsletter or follow our social media channels within Civicus to follow information about next events that will be happening. Um, with that, I would kind of close the event, but maybe also ask people to unmute themselves so we can give at least from speaker to speaker, a large amount, a round of an applause to everyone who joined this event. Thank you to all the speakers, interpreters, Thank and the you. whole background team. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Hi, Oli. Nice to see you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> bye, bye, everyone. Thanks. Good to bye. see you. Bye. 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 Hi, Alessandra. Hi, dear. Hello. <laughs> Learned a lot from everybody. <laughs>